Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ingenious Talks Online. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Lori Kilpatrick, and I'll be serving as the host for today's event. Um, we'll review a few housekeeping items before we begin. Um, so all attendee microphones and videos have been muted. However, there is the option to ask a question uh, by typing in the Q&A box on your screen. Following the presentation, we will address as many questions as possible, um, but please be mindful that with the high volume of questions, um, that it might not be able to answer all of them. We'll also be sending a post-event survey to all attendees via email, and do welcome your feedback. All right, now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Jason Jaskolka. Dr. Jaskolka is an assistant professor in the Department of Systems and Computer Engineering and the Director of the Cyber Security Evaluation and Assurance Research Lab at Carleton University. Today he'll be speaking about staying secure in the era of smart things. Concerns about privacy and security has increased and Dr. Jaskolka's presentation will explore and discuss the challenges and considerations for staying secure in the era of smart things. Thank you, Dr. Tuskolka, for joining us today. And now I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Welcome, everyone. Um, so today, what we're going to talk about is how do we stay secure in our new era of smart things? And uh, as mentioned in the introduction, over the last decade or so, we've seen a, a major boom in the number of devices that now collect and store all kinds of information, communicate all kinds of information about uh, their environments, and we are people that live in those environments. So the concerns related to each of these devices from a security and privacy perspective have now really reached the forefront. And what we're gonna talk about today is really how do we uh, navigate the challenges and what are the different considerations we need to have when trying to stay secure in this new era. So what we're gonna be talking about is really, how did we get here, right? So the first thing that, that we need to understand is what is the era of smart things? And over the past, let's say 25 years or so, we've seen this major increase in the number of devices that now have more and more embedded software that are, uh, controlling, that are collecting, that are providing all kinds of unique services uh, to end users and consumers like ourselves. And what we see on the, this slide here is really this explosion of these kinds of devices. And uh, this slide is really showing us that at the current date, 2020, we are now reaching uh, approximately 50 billion of these smart devices, these connected devices uh, within our, our daily lives, right? And this is the case um, when we look around all of our homes. We're all at home these days. Um, and how many of us have these kinds of smart things, these smart devices? These smart devices are these more digitized, smarter and in interconnected devices. Gone are the days where we have these nice little uh, alarm clocks. We now have these fancy connected devices that connect to our mobile devices, have all these apps. Uh, the same goes for things like watches. Um, the traditional watch, while still somewhat popular, is now being eclipsed by smart watches, like an Apple Watch, for example. Uh, thermostats have become much smarter. Uh, we no longer have these nice Honeywell dial thermostats. Uh, many houses now have nests, for example. Uh, the same, how many of us have an old style kitchen timer anymore? And how many of us actually use an Amazon Alexa, for example, and just say, Alexa, set me a timer for five minutes while my dinner cooks, right? The same goes with paper. Many of us don't use paper anymore. We now have tablets where we can digitize everything. We can share our notes very easily. Uh, through uh, communication technologies. And we can start going into the realm of more exotic smart things. So toothbrushes, for example, 
We no longer have our nice toothbrush that uh, the dentist usually gives us, but now we can have a smart toothbrush that's going to have all kinds of information about how our, our brushing habits are, uh, what our oral health is, and doing all kinds of data analytics from the data that it's collecting while we're brushing our teeth. And perhaps one of the, the most humorous ones that I came across while preparing this, this lecture is, uh, even for our pets, we can now get a smart litter box, for example. I don't know exactly what you're going to do with the smart litter box, but um, it exists and it's collecting information and uh, performing all kinds of data analytics for uh, how, how your pet's health would be. Let's, let's put it that way. So with the introduction of all of these smarter interconnected devices, we have reached this market where we now are in what we call the era of smart things. Uh, and what this refers to is simply the fact that we now have all kinds of devices that are collecting information, processing information, and actually communicating with each other in their environments. And ultimately, what the era of smart things is telling us is that we have just about smart everything. Think of something that we used, let's say, 20 years ago. Now there's a smart version of that. So smart watches, smart meters, smart homes, smart TVs, smart fridges, smart computers, smart toys, smart scales, and the list goes on and on. So why is this becoming a problem? Well, any of us who've been keeping an eye on the news lately, uh, we seem to find that security and privacy concerns related to these kinds of smart things, these smart devices, are actually taking over the daily news. Um, there are always uh, uh, these kinds of headlines that are describing the security and privacy vulnerabilities, concerns, or breaches in these kinds of devices. So for example, just recently, uh, perhaps a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was this, this article about how uh, adversaries can take over your connected home hubs and have remote control of uh, devices within your household. Uh, not too long ago as well, there was uh, several bugs in Nest security cameras that would allow an attacker to actually take control of your camera and spy on your house. Smart TVs had a lot of problems over the past uh, year or so. And it even got to the point where the FBI in the United States was releasing specific warnings about owners of smart TVs and ensuring that they were taking the necessary precautions to avoid uh, takeover of those devices, especially because many smart TVs now have cameras and microphones in them. Continuing on this trend of, of cameras, uh, it wasn't too long ago as well that we found out that even our robotic vacuums, for example, that have cameras to help them actually navigate through the house could be hacked and could, uh, adversaries could actually uh, uh, connect to this camera and start spying on your house again. Um, so you can see that these are, are launching into very uh, uh, troubled waters, right? And if you weren't convinced yet, um, many of us have kids at home and even they are not safe. Now we have all kinds of smart toys and these smart toys all collect information and have connected uh, technologies that again give rise to many security and privacy concerns. So there was this Cloud Pets teddy bear that was found to have been leaking uh, 2 million uh, recordings of conversations between parents and their children. Uh, this is my favorite of these stories is this doll. Uh, this doll's name is Kayla actually. Uh, and what they found is that you can actually use this doll to hack into smart homes. Um, so what they were doing um, and what was shown is that this uh, doll, which has a speaking capability where you can actually make this doll uh, say something, uh, could it be actually used to unlock your doors, uh, your front doors uh, voice activated lock uh, by simply saying uh, to the doll to tell the door to unlock. 
um, which is just a, a mind-blowing uh, a way of, of having an uh, intruder enter into your home, if you will. Um, and again, more recently, and these kinds of stories come out very close to, to Christmas time when, when uh, there's a lot of toys being bought, um, but there were security flaws uh, in many smart toys, um, like these little walkie-talkies, um, as well as uh, karaoke microphones and these kinds of things uh, that enabled uh, adversaries to either uh, talk to kids through these, these devices or to actually uh, record information uh, from them. So with all of these different headlines, and I mean, this is just a, a quick sample of the news headlines over the last year or two, uh, you can very much see that there are many concerns and many issues associated with these kinds of smart devices. And as we get more and more and more of them, this really feels like a runaway train. So what can we do about this, right? So the first thing is that we need to understand what is security? What does this mean in our context? So security for us refers to the process of, of preventing unauthorized access or modification, use, misuse, or denial of use of any of the information that's stored, accessed, or transferred from a computing system to some external recipient. This is a very broad general uh, purpose uh, definition of security. And the reason why we're going to use this today is because of the breadth of it and it allows us to cover all of the different capabilities that many of these smart things now have. And ultimately, what this definition of security refers to is what we call the CIA triad. CIA stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And these are the primary properties that we want for a secure system. We want to ensure that the data that's being collected, stored, transferred is going to remain confidential so that it doesn't uh, have access to unauthorized parties, that it has integrity so that it's not being modified uh, or misused uh, by potential adversaries, and that it's available so that the information that's collected, uh, if we need it for some critical task, we're actually able to, to use that information when it's required. And what makes a secure system is the fact that a secure system is going to continue to function correctly, even in the presence of adversaries. And this includes things like the hardware and the software running on these devices. These devices are not just software, they're not just hardware, they're a combination of these. And security also covers intentional and unintentional threats. So it's not always the case that there is a malicious intent to cause a security breach. Sometimes it's actually an unintentional uh, uh, configuration of a device, for example, that enables it to uh, uh, leak information, for example, to an unauthorized party. So when we think about a secure system, really what we're, we're looking to have is a system that's going to preserve these uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability properties and function correctly even while under attack. A related notion to security is that of privacy. And privacy refers to our, the processes of uh, restricting the collection, the storage, the use, and the destruction of personally identifiable information or other sensitive information. And why privacy is a major concern with these kinds of smart things is that this notion of privacy gives rise to many different technological issues, legal issues, and political issues. Um, and often it's improper or non-existent confidentiality controls that is the root cause of privacy issues. So when we think back to the examples of many of these smart things that I, I mentioned earlier, there are a significant number of them that collect or have the potential to collect this personally identifiable information or other sensitive information from the environments in which they operate. So this could be anything from uh, your name, your address, the location of this device, uh, any health information uh, and so on. 
that's, that's being um, collected and processed by these devices and perhaps transferred to uh, a third party for additional processing. So we need to ensure that we have uh, uh, this notion of privacy in mind when actually designing and, and using these kinds of devices. Um, just to give a, another uh, few definitions to make sure that we all have a common understanding of the terminology, uh, when we say an adversary, an adversary is going to refer to any malicious entity that's uh, aiming to prevent the users of these devices from achieving their security goals. So what that primarily means is they're going to violate the privacy, the integrity, the availability of the data in uh, these devices. Vulnerabilities refer to weaknesses in the devices that are going to allow an adversary to gain access to the data or to the system itself. And a threat refers to any possible danger that might actually exploit a vulnerability, one of these weaknesses, to actually breach the security and cause some kind of, of harm to the user. So how does all of this come together? So how this all comes together is that in our smart things, our smart devices, there are vulnerabilities. And to think that a device doesn't have any vulnerabilities is a rather naive approach to this. Um, typically, there are going to be weaknesses in the system, and those could come through many different uh, vectors or in many different facets of those devices. So they can come through the software, through the hardware, through the connection technologies, through the fact that many of these devices actually interoperate with each other and have to exchange information with one another. There are users of these devices. These devices have complex supply chains. There's also the IT and mobile infrastructures that all of these devices uh, uh, use in order to achieve their operations. So once we establish that there's the possibility of these vulnerabilities within these devices, we then have to think about well, how can these vulnerabilities be exploited? And this can be done through a number of different means. Uh, adversaries can tamper with the data that's being collected and sent. They can deny service. So an example of this is imagine that you want to uh, uh, set a timer for your, uh, your, your dinner tonight, uh, and you ask Alexa to set a timer for 10 minutes while you're cooking your dinner, and it simply cannot do it because there's a denial of service. So how do you now set your timer? That becomes the question. Um, there's issues of impersonation for these devices to actually pretend as if they're uh, providing you services that you want while they are in fact performing some malicious activities. Um, we can have eavesdropping with so much communication that's happening between all of these different devices. Uh, it's possible that unauthorized parties are able to eavesdrop on the information that's being collected. Um, and this is the case with many of the examples um, from the news headlines, uh, particularly related to the, the smart toys, for instance. Um, we can have malwares and ransomwares that are going to uh, enable adversaries to uh, perform attacks that are going to deny the services that are provided, that are going to have some impact on the system operation as well. And we also have a class uh, of exploits that could be introduced into the actual hardware circuitry itself. Um, and those are referred to as hardware trojans, where it appears as if everything is working properly, but there's actually some malicious uh, circuitry in the hardware that will be activated at a certain point in time, which will enable bypassing of particular security mechanisms, for example. And once we have these exploitations, we then have to think about, well, what are the risks and the impacts that can occur when any of these exploits occur? So there can be safety implications. We can have impacts on the well-being of the people or the environment in which these devices are operating. We can have data breaches. This is the most common that we hear about in the news. Um, this is the loss or the destruction of data or the release of data to unauthorized uh, parties, for example. Um, when we think about these kinds of smart devices being used in uh, business or enterprise contexts, we can have impact to the actual service availability. So these devices, these networks, uh, 
can be unavailable to the users and therefore uh, basically kill the business uh, uh, continuity of uh, the, the companies associated with those devices. If there are breaches of security for particular devices, there can be brand and reputation uh, impacts, uh, a loss of trust in certain manufacturers of these devices, for example. And then of course, from the business side of this, uh, any sort of security uh, breach will result in an impact in terms of revenues and costs. So this includes the costs associated with actually remedying the, the issues that existed within the devices, uh, uh, accommodating for any downtime impact on uh, the business continuity, for example, and any particular lawsuits or fines that might be associated with the leak of uh, personally identifiable information, for example. So there are many uh, legal precedents uh, for actually uh, instilling large fines for these kinds of breaches. So this gives us basically our, our uh, overview of the main concepts that we want to talk about today. Um, so where we're going with this is the fact that this isn't a simple problem to solve. Uh, smart things are great, right? Many of us have smart devices in our homes, for example, and they are very convenient. They provide us with a lot of interesting uh, services, but they can be quite dangerous. So how many of us have seen, for example, when using our computers, this kind of an error message that something's crashed? Well, what happens when this happens within some of our more critical smart devices that are now running all kinds of software that are running all kinds uh, of critical services? So imagine that your fridge crashed. What does that actually mean? Right? So this is really something that we need to start thinking about. Um, while a smart fridge may offer a lot of convenient services, uh, there is the opportunity for serious impacts if the software or the hardware within that fridge are maliciously attacked, causing it to crash, for example. The same goes when we start thinking about what do all of the smart devices that are in our home actually know about us, right? Each of these devices is collecting all kinds of information, but are we actually aware of what all of those devices know? Um, and these are uh, uh, very interesting questions. Um, so on the slide here, we have a, a, a fun comic uh, that's showing what perhaps some of these uh, devices might know about you. Um, and this is a very nice uh, a comic series called The Joy of Tech. Um, they have a lot of these sorts of fun uh, uh, comics that highlight these kinds of issues. Um, so for example, think about what your fridge knows about you if you have a smart fridge. Think about what your, your thermostat knows about you if you have a smart thermostat, for example. How about your light? How about your vacuum, for example, right? And this gets worse when we start thinking about how critical are these devices in our daily lives? How much do we actually rely on them? So again, uh, another comic from this, this same artist, um, we think about that those smart devices and what happens if, for example, uh, they are subject to a ransomware attack. So a ransomware attack is an attack where there will be a denial of the service uh, or the data that's collected by the device until a particular ransom is paid. So it's almost like uh, having your, your smart devices taken hostage, for example. So what happens if, for example, your smart toaster no longer can make toast unless you pay up the ransom? You're not gonna have a very enjoyable breakfast. Um, and this, this, it's a bit uh, sensationalized, with, with the, a comic like this, but the reality is, is that this is entirely possible with a lot of these devices. So it really comes down to thinking about how do we actually go about engineering these devices in order to address the security concerns and the privacy concerns that we have because of the mass reliance on such devices in our daily lives. So in order to do this, we really need to understand the challenges associated with smart devices. So the first thing is that many of these devices rely on software systems that will uh, 
allow for those devices to actually provide many of their, their uh, services. So one of the things that can happen is we can have software bugs and flaws. And these software bugs or software flaws in the programming on these devices can allow access to uh, systems or networks to which these devices are connected. And what that could re result in is sensitive and critical data being lost and stolen. So what we need to do is make sure that when we're uh, writing the software for our smart devices, we need to ensure that we have proper uh, mechanisms in place to identify and uh, mitigate as many software bugs and flaws as we can find. Similarly, I mentioned earlier that we also have uh, hardware in these devices. And there's a potential for malicious hardware circuits to exist. And what malicious hardware circuits are going to do is provide adversaries with very stealthy attack vectors. When there's a, a malicious hardware circuit, it's very difficult to figure out how an attacker is actually uh, 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 compromising that device. And what malicious hardware circuits uh, typically lend to is information leakage. Um, so it will allow an adversary to learn information that they're not authorized to learn. It could result in privilege escalation, which is basically an adversary gaining more and more capabilities in order to conduct uh, more and more uh, sophisticated uh, attacks on the system uh, at large. It could uh, provide login backdoors or ways in which to steal passwords to again uh, facilitate that, that kind of privilege escalation. So we have to be considerate of the hardware that is in these devices as well. Many of these devices are, are connected and many of them connect uh, using wireless technologies. And why this becomes a major challenge is that adversaries no longer require physical access to obtain the information or to tamper with the devices themselves. So this could lead to things like eavesdropping, um, for specific kinds of devices, it could lead to forced battery depletion. So when you have devices that have uh, batteries, for example, um, you can exploit the wireless connectivity to ensure that you basically drain the battery on these devices. Um, furthermore, you can track these devices, you can take remote control of them. And all of this wireless connectivity is enabled in many of these smart devices because that is fundamentally how they're, they're designed to work. But it, with that convenience, we now have this additional challenge to deal with. Uh, similarly, when all these different devices that we have start interoperating with each other, start communicating with each other, um, we have a number of different protocols, ways in which they have to uh, uh, communicate and those protocols define the sequence of operations between these different devices. And when we have devices that use different protocols, we need to make sure that there is protection of the data as we start uh, basically uh, connecting these kinds of protocols together. So when there's the handoff that happens of the data, we need to make sure that we're going to be able to preserve the security and protect the data when that handoff occurs. And that's a very challenging problem because we have devices that use Bluetooth and devices that connect by Wi-Fi or by cellular uh, technologies, for example. And all of these devices are expected to all work together. Uh, from an engineering perspective, one of the main challenges we have to deal with with smart things and smart devices is resource constraints. Many of these devices are small, which means they have little memory, they have uh, uh, limited battery life, limited processing power, and often they have physical limitations. Um, and why this becomes a major challenge for us is that these constraints limit the options that we have for actually uh, ensuring the security and privacy of the devices. Furthermore, there's always conflicting requirements, right? As an end user of a smart device, we want the device to be as easy to use as possible, and we want to make sure that we're going to have all of the, the bells and whistles, all the fancy services that it provides. But in order to provide all of that, there is often trade-offs that need to be made with respect to security, privacy, and safety. 
Um, when we think about those concepts with respect to the utility or the usability of these devices, uh, really these are at odds with one another. By making things more secure, you often have to have a trade-off in terms of something like performance or something like the eventual usability. Think, for example, when you add a password to a device. Every time you need to access the device, you need to now uh, input your password. Well, that's kind of annoying, but it does add to the security. So there's that trade-off that needs to be made. Beyond to those technological challenges, we also have challenges in terms of the actual process by which these devices are, are built and designed. So there are some regulatory challenges. Uh, regulations give restrictions on uh, the way in which some classes of devices are able to operate. Um, and regulations will require compliance with uh, local legislations, standards, uh, and that sort of thing. So an example for us is that devices that are collecting personally identifiable information need to comply with the Privacy Act in Canada, for example. And depending on other kinds of information, there may be other regulations that, that require compliance as well. And the challenge here is that issues can arise when there is a lack of regulation and a lack of standards. When the manufacturers of such devices uh, go to design, uh, them, one of the issues that they can face is that they don't know what they're supposed to comply with and therefore they end up choosing a minimum because it actually covers their bottom line the best. Um, so that becomes a major challenge to deal with. In addition, many of these devices don't build every single part, every single component in-house. There are hundreds of thousands of devices, tens of thousands of types of these devices, thousands of manufacturers and suppliers of the parts for these devices. There's always this risk of having an intentionally compromised hardware or software system that's put into a device. Somewhere that a, a vulnerability was introduced earlier in a supply chain, for example. So that's something that's very difficult to deal with as well. And then the final and probably most important challenge is that from an organizational perspective, Security needs to be built into the product itself, the actual smart device, which is much of what we've been talking about so far, but also into the people that are going to be using these devices. So we need to consider these people, these users as well. And one of the main challenges that we have is that often technically viable security and privacy measures could either be undermined by the people involved, case in point, writing your passwords down on sticky notes, uh, even though we have that security measure in place, that is completely uh, useless when your password is written down. Um, or the security and privacy measures may actually be undesirable to consumers. Uh, the fact that having a security and privacy measure in place, making a device much more difficult to use, could simply result in consumers not adopting that device at all. So in order to address these challenges, it's important that we actually uh, develop and maintain threat models and assess the risks associated with the people involved during the development of the device. And what this requires is that systematic plans or policies for actually identifying, monitoring, and resolving these kinds of security incidents need to be established. And what this really boils down to is providing the proper incentives for actually reporting security and privacy breaches and incentives for people to actually use the security mechanisms that are provided in the devices. So when we think about this, this becomes a, a, a big challenge because we have to now understand the potential uh, users of our devices. And that varies quite dramatically. So when we think about these, these challenges, just a few more uh, uh, fun uh, comics here, uh, there is always this problem of passwords. Um, so here, for example, uh, we know that the worst passwords out there, they top the list every single year of, of the most common passwords are things like one, two, three, four, five, six, or simply password. 
And it's not enough to simply say that my password's not on that bad passwords list, so therefore I'm good to go. Uh, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, at the same time, uh, it's very difficult for us to remember lots and lots of randomized passwords. Um, think about how many passwords you have for the different accounts that you deal with on a daily basis. Um, it becomes very challenging to deal with that many passwords over and over and over again, especially when they're completely randomized, as if you pulled them out of your alphabet soup, for example. So what a lot of this boils down to is this lack of awareness and training for how to actually use the devices, right? So when we think about these, these people challenges, if you will, we have to ask ourselves, well, do we know any better, right? So according to a, a recent survey, there was a question that asked, how much cybersecurity training has your current employer provided to you? And when we look at the results of this, and this was from May 2018, uh, we find that one third of the respondents of this survey have said they've received no cybersecurity training whatsoever. Uh, 16 more percent said a little bit. So we're looking at uh, around 50%, just under, of people that have received very little to no cybersecurity training from their employers themselves. Um, and this, as you can imagine, is quite a problem. The same goes when we start thinking about uh, privacy. So the, the most recent survey from the Office of the Privacy Commissioner in Canada had a question that asked, in general, how concerned are you about the protection of your own privacy? And not surprisingly, this uh, 2018 result, 37% uh, of the respondents were extremely concerned about the protection of their privacy, with another 20% saying they're just simply concerned. So this accounts for half the, the, the respondents saying that they have concerns about their own privacy. So what does this mean? Well, a follow-up question that was asked in this same survey asks what actions have you actually taken when it comes to protecting your own personal information? And here, we find that, well, the good news is, is that we have 75% now of respondents saying they've actually done some changing of the settings to limit the amount of personal information that's shared um, in an application, for example. And a similar number was provided for just simply not installing or uninstalling apps that they thought were going to be a risk to uh, the protection of their personal information. When I look at these, these numbers, for example, what I find uh, promising is that since 2011, this has increased quite a, dr dramatically. But what I find concerning is that since 2016, for some reason, um, I'm not quite sure why, but this number has actually dropped. So what this is, is, is saying is that while people are extremely concerned about their privacy, somehow we're doing less now to actually take action to protect our personal information that should be held private. Um, and that, that's a bit concerning and it's a bit uh, uh, counterintuitive of what you think given all of the information that we provide about uh, how you should be uh, adjusting security settings, not installing apps, so on and so forth. Um, so these numbers are, are a bit surprising, but it does in fact reflect the reality of the situation. And what it really points to is that there is this lack of awareness, this lack of training, and we can do better. So how can we actually uh, address these challenges? So there are a number of solutions that we can, we can try to employ as engineers of these, these kinds of smart things. Uh, one way we can do this is to provide cryptographic solutions. So this is how we can protect sensitive information, both in transit or in storage. But this is very difficult to do when we have limited resources. We can have authentication and non-repudiation. What this means is that we can ensure that we're only going to communicate with trusted devices and that the data that we're sending and receiving is in fact trustworthy. Um, but again, these kinds of mechanisms face similar difficulties to our cryptographic solutions in the sense that when we have limited resources, it becomes very challenging to actually 
employ these mechanisms on these smart devices. Uh, we can have intrusion detection. So can we identify malicious code, malicious circuits, or malicious behaviors of the devices? But again, these detection methods incur all kinds of performance overhead. So as we're consistently monitoring for any sort of malicious behaviors, we're now using many of the limited resources that we have in order to uh, uh, perform those uh, checks. The other thing we can do, and arguably one of the most easy things we can do, is to just have uh, a policy in place that outlines the plan for when something eventually happens. So what's the plan to deal with any security or privacy issues that we uh, come across? This often helps us to solve those organizational and technical issues that we, we just talked about. And this is often mandated by regulators uh, and, and dictated by the standards uh, bodies that many of these devices need to comply with. So having these policy plans is very much like having a fire escape plan. We hope that we never actually have to use it, but in the eventual case that we do, then we have a plan in place and we're able to gracefully handle this and address the issues as they come. Beyond that, we can uh, increase the security and privacy awareness of end users, of employees of the organizations developing these, these devices, and really everyone involved in, in this uh, ecosystem. So ultimately, the security of these smart devices is really dependent on the people that use them. Um, so one of the things that we can do is establish what we call good cyber hygiene. And what cyber hygiene is referring to is the way in which uh, people are trained to actually protect themselves while using these smart devices. So this could be anything from changing your passwords regularly uh, to making sure that you can identify and, and uh, uh, know the differences between phishing emails and not, know the difference between secured Wi-Fi connections and not, and these sorts of things. And there's a lot of online guidance, especially from our, our uh, Canadian Cybersecurity Center, uh, outlining what good cyber hygiene looks like. And really what this is boiling down to is focusing on actually changing the behaviors and breaking the status quo. And what this means is that when we go back to those, those uh, uh, charts showing the results of the survey with respect to privacy concerns, um, when we say we're extremely concerned about our privacy, we should in fact be doing something actively to ensure that we are protecting our information. And that requires a change in the behavior. It's very easy to just simply use these devices, um, but often we have to take um, a lot of a proactive approach to uh, address these issues. Similarly, many of us use these kinds of devices and there's no getting away from that. So what we need to do is we actually need to think about what are the potential risks associated with using these devices and of sharing any particular pieces of information. What could potentially go wrong if we do this? What could our devices actually know about us, right? And what could happen if that information gets into the wrong hands? Um, and then of course, there's uh, simple other things that form good cyber hygiene, like applying software patches and updates for our devices. The challenge with many smart devices is we often don't know how to do this for some devices. Uh, for example, how do you update your fridge or your thermostat or your car, right? Often we have to rely on, on the manufacturers uh, to provide us with the appropriate guidance or to help us along uh, this kind of, of path. So just to wrap things up uh, about this discussion, um, what we've seen over the past uh, I'm going to call it about 25 years, is the creation of a world where information technology permeates everything that we do. Um, so it's part of our economy, it's part of our social interactions, and it's even part of our intimate selves. We have so many devices that now know so much information about us. These smart devices promise all these great benefits, but with them comes this exposure to this new frontier of security and privacy threats. 
So unless we have appropriate countermeasures, the doors are going to stand wide open for cyber attackers. And we need to explore new ways to increase our knowledge, to shape our attitudes, and to change our behaviors, right? So we need to learn more about these issues. We need to actually have that proactive attitude and then act upon it in order to help uh, shield ourselves from the potential security risks that come with these kinds of devices. So some of the open research problems that uh, myself and my, my students in the, the Cybersecurity Evaluation and Assurance Research Lab are doing to address these challenges and these issues is we're exploring issues of secure design and building in security. Really, we're trying to answer that question, how do we engineer devices that operate in a zero trust environment? So when you constantly think that someone's going to be attacking that device, how do you build it so that it's going to be resilient to that? We look at security assurance and certification. So how can we assure regulators and users that the devices that are built and their data are going to remain secure? How do they get the confidence that their information is going to be protected when using this device? Uh, we look at approaches for mitigation and resilience. So how do we actually uh, mitigate or deal with the effects of a cyber attack to ensure that any sensitive information remains secure and private. And we're actively involved in security and privacy awareness. Um, so just how do we increase this awareness to both the manufacturers of these devices as well as all of the end users. So just to wrap up here, um, there are some references and some further reading. Um, one of the things that I'm just going to point out for, for the attendees is this last reference here. Um, this is from our communication security establishment in Canada. And it is basically a guideline for what good cyber hygiene looks like. It's a very simple to follow guide. Uh, many of these things are things that we've been told over and over and over again, but it never hurts to, to uh, review it from time to time to make sure that we're aware of these particular issues. Um, so anyone who's interested in, in looking further, um, there are lots of, of pieces of information uh, about many of the, the topics that we talked about here today. Um, and with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for, for joining and we'll open up uh, for questions. Um, so I think Laura is going to help me with that. Yes. All right. So we have some great questions. Um, so, um, in your experience, are there companies, types of products, or services that you would recommend avoiding as a consumer? Um, okay, Th this is a bit of a loaded question. Um, so, I don't want to sit here and basically say these are the, the blacklisted devices. Um, but what I can say is this, is that um, in my experience, yes, there are some devices that are more problematic than others. Uh, if you just simply look in the news, you'll see uh, some recurring themes. Um, but really what it comes down to is this, is every consumer needs to perform their own kind of risk assessment. When I, for example, am looking uh, to buy, let's say, a new toothbrush, yeah, I'm going to have a look at uh, the, the smart toothbrushes and see what kind of cool features do these have. And I might say that, you know what, these, these cool features are something that I'm really interested in. But then what I need to do is say, well, what are the risks associated with this? And for me, I might say, you know what, I don't really care if an adversary or some unauthorized party knows how long I brush my teeth for. But someone else might say, no, I really don't want anyone to know that. Um, and at that point, we now have different risk assessments. And what that means is that I'm going to have a different threshold than every other consumer out there. So in order to actually uh, 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 make this decision, we have to perform these kinds of risk assessments. Are we going to be happier with the benefits associated with this? Uh, a smart device being used in my, my daily life versus the risks associated with my personal information. And again, this is a very personal decision. So I don't, I don't really want to sit here and, and say, uh, 
what everyone should do with these devices. We all use them one way or the other, but really we need to just think a little bit more about how we use them and what these devices are actually learning about us. Great, thank you. Um, we should have time for one more question. Um, so how secure is the save password feature on my iPhone and my computer? So uh, there's a few, uh, I guess the way to approach this question is there are a few different uh, philosophies about saving passwords using uh, these technologies. Um, for many of these uh, password managers, whether they're the ones built into your devices, for example, or third parties, uh, many of them do go through a certification process that will actually show that they have uh, uh, done their due diligence to ensure that you are going to be preserving the privacy and confidentiality of the passwords that you've saved. Um, that doesn't mean that they're completely immune to security breaches. So for example, there was a, a story, I think it was maybe about a year or two ago of uh, the last pass password manager that had a security issue that basically if you didn't take action to update uh, could have exposed all of your saved passwords. So again, just like with all these other devices, it becomes this risk assessment of uh, do I want to have the potential for this to happen? What's the likelihood that all of my passwords are compromised? What is the trouble that I'll have to go through if that happens? And ultimately make that decision. Um, more specifically, like this, this question of how secure, um, this is, is really one of the questions that we would love an answer for. There is no good answer to how secure is secure. Um, again, that really is dependent on the specific uh, system that we're talking about, uh, the specific uses of that system, and the specific classes of users uh, as well. I hope that answered the question. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Tuskolka. Uh, much appreciated. And thank you to everyone for making the time to join us today. Uh, we really hope that you did enjoy the conversation. So as mentioned previously, we will be sending a brief post-event survey um, to all that attended via email and we do welcome your feedback. All right, keep well and hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining.